Thanks so much, Arthur. All right, I'm going to get the volume about right. First thing I want to say is subversive. Good. It's an old word, and to me, it sums up something really important, the way change happens. As a researcher and a campaigner for 20 years, that's the thing that stuck with me. Ideas that can both appeal to powerful elites and carry transformative values, values that challenge existing certainties and potentially overturn existing hierarchies. That's what we need, and what I want to do in the next 15 minutes is try to convince you why sharing can be such a powerful, transformative uh, approach. If it is promoted by cities as a guiding purpose. So, I put down the slide thing. That was what I was going to say there. So, um, I'm not denying that sharing is changing in the modern world. There's been a major shift. Oh. Try the right slide, thank you, sorry. So the mainstream narratives of the sharing economy are a problem here. What we have is people telling us we need to look for the next uh, sharing unicorn or Uber for X. These frame sharing powerfully as an economic narrative. They tell us that what matters about sharing is the economic utility it provides. They make sharing a transactional process one that perhaps delivers a little bit of environmental efficiency and move towards zero waste. And most importantly, they tell us that it's a process that is spreading as commercial platforms supported by risk-hungry venture capital invest in new technology and new software. The role that's left for public bodies is simply to facilitate this um, economic process and try and generate more growth. That leaves us to wonder, should we be cheering on this hunt or should we be rejecting the commodification, the co-option of sharing that this seems to imply and therefore reject the sharing economy? Well, I want to suggest there's a third way. Now, I'm not denying that sharing is changing in the modern world. We've seen the erosion of family-based, kin-based, communal sharing as social capital has declined. It's been replaced with um, intermediated sharing, which is booming, particularly online, as a result of the availability of modern uh, web technologies, the mobile web, which allows sharing in real time and with strangers. But the critical point here is to remember that the intermediaries in sharing need not only be corporations, nor, to be honest, need they be only online. So in, we see from city bike shares to neighborhood tool banks, a burgeoning set of intermediaries in all four Cs, the commercial, the civic, the charitable, and the communal. Now, it's true. We live in an age of austerity and neoliberalism, and there are real pressures for commercial sharing to displace the communal and civic process, uh, facilities that pre-existed. But I want to try and convince you, oddly enough, that seen through a subversive lens, the sharing economy isn't all bad. In our sharing paradigm idea, we neither reject the economic framing nor see it as the totality of everything. We recognize those twin pressures towards more commercialization and towards more intermedia intermediation, and we engage with both the opportunities and the risks that they engender. So the sharing paradigm covers a very broad space. All of this uh, two by two, from the increasingly ubiquitous commercial platforms through the still commercial yet more peer-to-peer -peer models of Linux and uh, Enspiral and indeed traditional offline cooperatives, the um, civic and charitable models like FreeCycle and public libraries and the collective commons of shared streets and public spaces. 
What this shows us is that it encompasses both our evolved nature as sharers, an inherited sociocultural nature, and the modern zeitgeist of learned, intermediated sharing behaviors. But perhaps more importantly, it reminds us that the real sharing experts are not the Johnny-come-lately corporates, but the experienced commoners, cooperatives, and the managers of civic services for sharing health, education, arts, and transport. Now, this rich territory of sharing, not surprisingly, houses a rich diversity of sharing cities. In San Francisco, we see a vibrant but controversial sharing, um, share, commercial sharing economy led by the private sector, venture capital funded, but with scant regard for communal sharing. In Seoul, by contrast, we see a public, -led, public sector led and financed sharing city project with explicit social inclusion goals, erecting barriers be behind which local sharing enterprises are supported. And in Amsterdam, we see something of a public-private hybrid with uh, not only um, not-for-profit and communal models, but also a facilitated, though regulated, commercial sector. All three of these models draw on the technologies and the ideals of smart cities. And we heard this morning a little about smart cities. I think these cities, in various ways, make relatively little effort to engage with the downsides of smart cities that we heard about. And I want to contrast these, the, so -called, the, the sharing smart cities, with cities that rarely actually talk about sharing per se, but that do actually put social ideals at the heart of their policy. So the smart sharing cities use the sharing economy to stimulate economic growth. They engage in competition for inward investment and indeed for footloose hipsters. They treasure technology for the competitiveness that it brings. Despite their wealth, they buy into a political dialogue, a political narrative of austerity and cut public services, treating citizens purely as consumers. The contrasting narrative of social urbanism treats people as citizens, has explicit social aims, cooperates in city networks and with neighboring areas to address issues of real need. Such cities genuinely share an urban commons. Now, that might sound like activists' dreams, but in cities in South America, such as Belo Horizonte, Porto Alegre, Bogota, and Medellin, such goals are not just the territory of activists, they're officially adopted by the cities. In Medellin, for example, the city has transformed itself through social urbanism, investing in an urban commons of public spaces and public services. It's built stunning architectural examples of library parks in the most deprived areas. It's linked poor communities to the center with bus rapid transit, outdoor escalators, and cable cars. It's provided health, education, and arts facilities. It's funded all of these with revenues from the public utilities company, and it's guided the process with participatory planning and participatory budgeting. So to recap, we believe or suggest that there are two competing discourses. In the smart cities economic discourse, the economy comes first. It's seen as what's needed to build a healthy society. And the environment, well, that's just another resource. But that seems to me to be completely the wrong way around. We should recognize instead that a healthy economy depends on having a healthy society, and that a healthy society in turn relies on a healthy environment. And that means that the social, the cultural, the political, and indeed the environmental dimensions of sharing are at least as important as the economic ones. In the sharing paradigm, therefore, um, as in social urbanism, we recognize people as social beings, 
vulnerable and interdependent, not the individual automatons of economic theory. We treat sharing as relational and mutual, not as transactional. And rather than hunting for market-based solutions to the social and environmental challenges we face, we target deeper change, looking at behaviours, looking at norms and values, and indeed, even at our identities. Oddly, though, in many contexts and many locations, even the most hardcore commercial sharing platforms can help deliver the cultural change that we need, especially if they're backed by a proportional regulatory framework. Sharing initiatives challenge consumerism by changing norms, shifting identities, and normalizing countercultures. Now, you maybe know of Rent the Runway. It might seem as though it's something that would simply reinforce brand-oriented consumerism. But actually, what's going on here is a process that is democratizing access to even the most elite designer labels. And that is unintentionally, but inevitably, undermining their status. Even this example of sharing shows us that a move away from a dependence on brands and possessions to define ourselves and towards a dependence on relationships and access. We see also powerful forces in toy libraries, perhaps a little more explicitly here, where parents use them to share their anti-consumerist values with their kids. Incidentally, research shows that toy libraries also allow children to question, explore, and challenge their gender roles and identities. And countercultural sharing opportunities, such as file sharing, uh, squatting and skipping, or dumpster diving, as the Americans call it, spread new norms and values too. And it's in those shifting norms and values that sharing potentially seeds transformative political change. While the sharing paradigm challenges both market and state, we don't see a utopian or commune or crypto state somehow magically sweeping away established hierarchies. What we do believe is possible is for sharing to rebuild a collective politics and to help us reorientate that politics towards constructing our common future. Sharing technologies and infrastructures, notably cosmopolitan public spaces, both online and virtual, enable political disruption. But harnessing that disruption to build genuine sharing cities and to take those cities to share the urban commons as their primary purpose means that we all need to act not just as active sharers, but as active citizens. Active citizens who resist the political dialogues of division, the political dialogues of excluding migrants, all those things. We need to build an inclusive democracy. So the final slide I have just sets out some of the things that a genuine sharing city could be doing, whether that's through visionary leadership or through public uprising. They need to be proactive taking a lead in supporting sharing organizations. They should design for justice and inclusion um, with approaches that build trust and social capital. They can provide access for all by acting as a sharing hub, connecting services. They can experiment and should experiment with regulation and incentives using all the tools in the box. They need to engage with infrastructures, not just with services and institutions. And most of all, they need to share power, that the power they have themselves, with democratic models that empower users, protect civil liberties, and provide shared spaces for collective politics. Thank you so much for listening. I hope over the next couple of days that I'm going to have a chance to talk to as many of you as possible and learn from your experiences and stories too.